Hi everyone, before this video begins, I would like to thank Johnny Reinhardt and the American Festival of Microtonal Music. This is a composer symposium excerpt from Microtonal University's weekly meeting. If you are interested in learning more about this educational program, the link will be provided for you down in the description. Welcome, as one of the 4% of women producers, I welcome you excitedly to the fold. Thanks. I know you write and compose and are invested in tuning on top of that. So give me your quote unquote, aha moment. You were a pianist, I suspect, didn't find much um, in terms of biographical information about you. So I'm gonna have to ask you a few things um, in a pedestrian kind of way, but I suspect you started um, with a piano as one of your first instruments. Mm. And it was, I suspect, in equal temperament, and then you started working with synthesizers because that wasn't enough. And then bam, things started to open up for you. Actually, I started with percussion. So um, I started with percussion and then I got into audio production, sound design, music composition, and that took me into music theory. Um, and then I studied music theory, music composition. I was principal studying um, percussion and then I would just sneak out of my practice room and go play piano all the time so I started learning piano at that point um and yeah microtonality was always there for me it was always part of my early productions even when I kind of wasn't aware of it when I was studying sight singing in university um whenever I would have to sing purely through like sight and by ear I would accidentally sing in pure intonation so like my things would accidentally modulate or they would drift in various amounts or when I would like sing a major scale upwards and sing fa I would end up seeing it as like a 21 against 16 so then when I would try to modulate to like the key of four I would end up being a little bit flat against equal temperament so I started noticing all these things really early on um, but I didn't really understand how to uh, sort of interpret what was going on I just thought that my ear was kind of um, wrong. So from that, I got into microtonality. Well, about in 2017, I was kind of getting bored of music a little bit. I had been composing at that point for pretty much a decade. And, um, I just felt like in terms of production and timbres, it's felt like no matter what unique timbres I used or what arrangement of pitches I explored, they all sort of vibrated the same way because of the, the way that 12 equal tends to make things. And one of the biggest complaints that I have about 12 equal was the fact that no matter how dissonant or consonant something is, they sort of, all the chords and structures have like a fundamental similar level of discordance sort of baked into them. And so that was really dissatisfying for me. Um, I actually, one night my friend told me to listen to um, Aphoristic Madrigal by, um, by um what's his name fabio costa and then in that process i also heard michael harris's revelation and those two were my aha moments for me um so i got into that i started learning more about 31 at first and i realized you know it's approximation to the harmonic series and then quickly i was just like well i don't really need any equal system or tempered system at all i can just do pure intonation uh and so i sort of charged full speed into that domain um i do a lot of work with with voice and speech speech modification and so my awareness of the harmonic series was always there um but yes i pretty much exclusively compose in just intonation now oh thank you for that mm -hmm. um so when you start to 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 be aware that you are leaning toward mm -hmm. vibration that seemed internal to you in a mm -hmm. sense how did that form your musical sy syntax in 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 as a percussionist as a pianist mm -hmm. as a composer writer producer was it different from what you were expecting from yourself prior to discovering this or not not really i tend to think of everything as simply like a filter and an interface for sort of Mm, something that is a bit more fundamental. I tend to think that there is this sort of creative essence or individual essence that for me gets diluted 
it's sort of like liquid and it fills the container no matter the shape or form of the container so no matter what pitch pitches i had laid out in front of me or what instruments i had in front of me you know i'm going to create something that i find to be what i love and what i want to hear so the process of sort of getting into different pitch spaces and different timbre spaces and stuff it wasn't really it didn't really caused me to rethink the way I composed. It was just like sort of having more resolution and more freedom. Um, I mean, it's definitely influenced the way that I compose now, pr primarily because of the intersection between how, how you can produce so much more cleanly and you can mix so much more easily with just intonation. So like if you are mixing in 12 note equal temperament, when you create these large structures, I tend to mix all of my um, productions around the idea of like, a harmonic series so you know if you think about where you should space content across the frequency range i tend to think of it all always having some like meta harmonic pattern going on and i think the more you align yourself with that pattern the cleaner the speaker cone driver will vibrate so the cleaner the the mix will come out and the less muddy the noise will sound like so uh, i was always mixing that way to begin with and then by moving into pure intonation i was just allowed to sort of increase my level of concordance i got into microtonality once I realized that it didn't make things more dissonant, you could actually get more concordant and you could take consonant sounds or dissonant sounds that you love and you're familiar with or, or completely novel sounds and they can be rendered in completely more hyper concordant ways. And that's kind of one of the things that really drove me into microtonality. When I was studying music composition and I was, you know, studying music of the 20th century and stuff, like every example of microtonality that I heard was like shocking and dissonant and jarring and it was sort of intentionally um, avant-garde and that kind of put me off from it a little bit like I did like that music that's cool but just personally my voice as a composer I like to create sort of what I would deem to be like hyper beautiful hyper clean sort of colorful things and I felt like whenever I would hear microtonality like quarter tone works that were pushing in a very discordant way that would kind of push me away from microtonality. Thank you for that it's um true indeed that um, early uh, quote-unquote microtonal if that's even a term we should be using mm -hmm. work sounded like cats fighting in a bag and mm -hmm. that um, <laughs> made a general audience wary of the freedom inherently in it and so now um, what I'm seeing is with the influx of technology being more present in this field, mm -hmm. I'm seeing what you're describing. I'm seeing um, yeah. a seek for a new language, um, a seeking for a mix that, given the playback system that we have, mm -hmm. can enhance what we can do. Now we are moving forward toward virtual and toward other ways of, with Atmos and so on, other ways of experiencing mm -hmm. sound. Um, so to me, this is all really good news because we have, um, I think, come to a point where the possibilities of new mediums are going to be enhanced by what we talk, uh, call microtonality. Mm -hmm. And um, in that context, I see your work as well, especially when you talk about mixing, um, that is exciting to me um, mm -hmm. and how to organize frequencies again through the playback system that we mostly well, I tend utilize. To think, I tend to think that tuning is fundamental to timbre. I mean, I think most people here would agree with that. But so then if you're thinking about mixing, it's fundamentally about how you present the gestalt timbre of what you're creating. And I think that anyone who's a composer or a producer that is working in a digital domain and mixing, and they're not considering the pitch content or they're not considering sort of the the way that their frequencies are relating, I think that um, it's just all unified for me. They're kind of inseparable. So I got into this because fundamentally I was seeking exotic timbres and new new experiences, new sonorities. And then I sort of over time found, you know, a whole palette of new qualities that you can explore beyond that. Excellent. And perhaps a recipe for uh, budding producers who are open to utilizing all this would be mm -hmm. a little bit of Helmholtz and then a little bit of high-end um, production skills and see what comes out in the end mixed with personal aspirations and composition. A little, little, bit, of, of, little, little bit of Bonade <laughs> as well. Fundamentals in musical <laughs> acoustics is quite a great text. 
Yes. Wonderful. So tell us a little bit about your artist name. It's sort of a moniker. In my music, I sort of um, officially, unofficially play the role of a time-traveling cyborg who's kind of like a, a sort of... Um, Subversive. Sort of, yeah, it's kind of like, a, there's kind of lore behind my thing where, you know, in 2172, the cyborg got sort of commissioned to go back and study and archive like music and tunings from different cultures and sort of went rogue after having a spiritual harmonic experience. And so now this sort of cyborg individual uh, stands, stands to be um, potentially on trial for temporal tampering in at least two timelines. So... It's kind of a, you know, that a little bit. Um, Yeah. (laughs) All of my music is very hyper narrative. So I kind of like to have sort of these deeper things going on. And I like to try to use tuning to express that quality. So there is a, there is a meta opera in the making with your narrative. So please quit. (laughs) Yeah, you could say that. Are you going to share anything for us today? Yeah, I've got a couple excerpts. It depends on how much time I have. But, um, you know, I think one of the things I, I differ from the most from the other individuals who were speaking today is is I think that a lot of them very much inspire me and they sort of come from like the old guard of microtonality in this space. And I think that some traditional perspectives that are kind of just implied and kind of assumed often is this idea of like limit. Uh, I don't think of limit I don't interact with limit it doesn't really mean anything to me I just purely use any sections of the harmonic series that I want I don't think that higher primes are inherently more complex to perceive or anything like that I sort of have very much an egalitarian perspective towards the harmonic series and I kind of want to liberate as much of the harmonic series as possible so that opens up a lot of different perspectives. I sort of have my own theoretical framework that I operate in, which is like prime modality. So I tend to think of, you know, someone mentioned these identities, the higher you go up the harmonic series, you enter into these new sort of novel identities. Those novel identities for me are more like sections. They're not individual points that everything relates back to, but they're sort of like modes of the harmonic series that are sort of non-factorable or lower factorable. So I typically work in like harmonic mode sections of primes up to like one to two to three to four factors of that space and I've got a lot of different pieces I mean I'll play an excerpt of something I'm working on that is currently unreleased uh this is a piece called hex um I've been working on it for about a year the concept came to me a year ago um it's sort of not really a piece more like uh that experience you have in a dream where things that shouldn't be combined are combined so I'll go ahead and play this in stereo audio and let me know if you can hear it. We're gonna jump into the piece at around.
yeah, that piece is unreleased right now, but I've been working on that. It's in free just intonation. Um, it uses a lot of pre pre-designed structures, like for instance, what I like to do is I like to borrow structures from sort of sort of things around equal temperament or sort of um, generative structures from various equal temperaments, and then I like to sort of find where those align with various parts of the harmonic series so they have more like quality. So like this sort of so I'll create these little miniature compositions or like harmonic etudes, like this, or like like this in p with piano, which are in you know different forms of JI, and then I will kind of smash them up in, in that kind of thing there. I do a lot of work with acoustic jazz intonation, so like this is acoustic piano. And there's actually acoustic just intonated piano in that piece. And so it's kind of a lot of different things, but I guess, you know, if you tried to describe it in terms of prime limit or something, it wouldn't really make sense because I use sort of all harmonics fairly equally. I don't really think that lower complexity harmonics are more pure. I mean, yes, they have more like JI buzz, but you know, I, I view them as long as it's just intonated, it's, it's fair game. So yeah, thanks for listening to Hex. Um um, and for sharing work in progress. Oh, of course. Of Cyborg course. I and Simeon. <laughs> uh, futuristic stream of consciousness. I enjoy the juxtaposing um, jarring bravuras and um, the, cleanliness, the cleanliness of your mix and also the, um, uh, the, 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 the color scheme, if you wish. And mm -hmm. uh, there is definitely um, an approach uh, that you have and have honed since you speak of, um, and I appreciate that, since you speak of égalité et liberté, mm -hmm. <laughs> voilà, um, in terms of your pitch choices, I'm curious how would that apply to bringing in some dirt and what that would mean for you and how you would formulate it and would that in mm -hmm. affect your compositional structures? Yeah, so, so, oh, go ahead, please. What were you going to say? No, I just um, <laughs> wanted to check in sorry, with Johnny about mm -hmm. our time here and whether uh, we can have one more question or should we move on and then keep the question for later? Okay. Please do continue. I just finally got the headphones working so I can hear Amelia. Oh, hi. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. So, so yes, Amelia, um, what would dirt mean to you now that you've traveled this path? Um, mm -hmm. and would you ever entertain um, stepping away from your systems? Oh, yeah. I mean, here's some dirty stuff. So this is taking like 15 EDO and turning it into what I like to call a neji, which is a near equal just intonated structure. So I'll take a segment of the harmonic series and then I'll try to find where it most closely aligns to um, that 15 EDO. So like... This is kind of, this is a little bit dirtier than what I maybe would normally make. Or like, or I, this, I, dirt to me when it comes to things are, are more, um, that's a good question, Stephen. I'm not really sure. When it comes to rhythm, I don't really view meters or bars or, or beats as maybe you figured out when you transcribed my, my live improvisation. Um, time to me is sort of not real, nor is pitch. It's sort of a, a continuous process. So when it comes to noise or when it comes to dirt, like for instance, chords like this, this is a minor 11, flat 13, neutral 17, like down 18 with like a natural 20 and a harmonic 25th. These are kind of dirty. Or like this one. This starts out clean, but gets a little dirty. Or like things like, not this. Ooh, that's pretty, but chords like, um, so I'm very influenced by, you know, like these like hyper vertical macro harmonic perspectives that kind of exist in jazz or have previously existed in jazz. I that was one of the things that pushed me into microtonality is I got really obsessed with extending chords as far as possible. So like in, in, in 12 EDO, could you take a chord to the extended 25th or the 29th? And 
over time, I, I sort of hit the, the physical limit of what you could do with tricky implications on 12 EDO. So I kind of went seeking more notes so that I could get bigger chords and more interesting sonorities. But like things like this to me sound kind of dirty. This is like um like a seven sharp nine, uh, sharp 11, flat 13, sharp 15, sharp 21 chord. But it's in just sensation. So I tend to take a lot of these like hyper macro vertical structures and then bring them into this just intended world. This is kind of dirty. So, you know, we have a lot of sus seven add nines and like regular jazz, but you can kind of do like a sus seven add nine, but then take the nine at like 170 to 180 cents and you get these kind of, these sort of kind of ringing qualities and stuff. So, uh, there's all sorts of ways that you can get that dirt, but the thing is for me, it, it all still tends to be um, hyper concordant because it's just intonated. There was one piece, or there was one part during Hex where this chord was sounded. And it's the only thing in the entire piece that is equal temperament. It's A EDO because I needed something to feel sort of, a, a, of sort of remnants of sort of memories of human or sort of, um, opposite of this whole spiritual space. And so this chord is the only equal tempered thing in the entire piece. And I think that once again, you can hear compared to all those other chords, yes, it's dissonant, but it's also more discordant. It's just kind of muddy and mushy on the ears. So sometimes I'll, I'll draw into EDO for that stuff, but otherwise I, I tend to prefer this sort of unbridled, you know, just intonated pitch space. I have had, um, I have had synthesia all my life and my form of synthesia is particularly kinetic experience or somatic sensation on my body. So like if you feel the way that, you know, if you close your eyes and you move your head or you move your hands around, you can feel the proprioceptive and kinesthetic sensations that we have. Um, my synesthesia is that. So when I listen to sounds, some sounds in particular, they'll make me feel movements of my body that I can't quite do as a person. So I think that that really deeply informs the way that I experience timbre and it's really shapes the way that I hear the pitch space that I operate in. So. Absolutely. That is on point. And, um, note to everyone, we are experiencing these sounds and, 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 and the mix through our devices. So mm -hmm. the overall effect is a bit brighter then I'm sure it is in your original imagining, um, Amelia. Mm -hmm. So just put that in. Um, and um, in one of your videos, I saw you perform um, mm -hmm. in a semi-traditional way on, a, on, a, on an acoustic yep. piano. And, um, it was a rhythmically informed phrase and then I saw your left leg moving up and down. <laughs> or if that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. Um, every live performance that's ever been... Oh, sorry, you cut out. I don't want to talk over you. What were you saying? Uh, so I'm just, I was just worried, well, wondering if that is something that you do consciously while you play to inform the rest of your kinetic um, composition. It's not intentional. Um, actually, every single recorded video performance of me ever in history, you can see my leg tapping and it's at the exact same rhythm. So if you go and you look at a video from five years ago and then you look at a video of today, you will see that if you superimpose them, they're at basically the exact same BPM. I don't know what it is. My leg just does this when I play and I don't think it informs much, but it gives me this I, I'm very, um, I require multiple forms of stimulation. So essentially it's a way to self stim and to go deeper into the performance myself. So I often rock back and forth or, or twirl my hair, go side to side, tap a foot, tap my fingers. And I sort of balance all these sort of polyrhythms internally all the time, sort of just to dial in focus towards what I need to work on or what I need to not work on. Uh, but it's interesting you mentioned that because it's, it's definitely there. Um, and it's definitely, <laughs> oh, no, it's impossible to escape <laughs> on our way to singularity oh but very very good uh you might uh consider writing for dance uh mm -hmm. just to be in the movement and see what um your sound will do there for yeah, live that definitely sounds 
fascinating. At this point, you know, music is a very part-time hobby of mine. It's my main thing. It's the thing that I love the most, but I eventually want to find more time to where I can solely get back to music composition and, and creating art because I think that that's more important to me in the long run of things. Um, but, you know, the capitalist sort of pressures of society have pushed me towards having a, a sort of career and thing that I necessarily... So music for me is something I do now in the moonlight. I mean, my life is always interconnected to music and my work that I do in voice pedagogy and voice technology is inextricably connected to you know what I've done in music and they feed into each other but um you know if it were up to me I would just sit in my room all day and tune my piano because tuning itself is a very spiritual process to me this idea of sort of imposing your will on nature even though it will never ever last and it will always fade over time and it's a snapshot of a moment and there's something very special about this process of deep connection, very meditative listening, trying to listen as close and, and push the, th the sort of limits of your perception and the threshold as far as you can while sort of communicating with, with nature in such a way. And then knowing that it's like sandcastle where it will be washed away by, by the stream of time, no matter what. I think that that's very grounding and humbling. And that's one of the things that I love about tuning acoustic instruments. The fact that you can't Th really tune them. <laughs> Um, yes, excellent. Interconnectivity is um, mm -hmm. where we're at. And as John has put it, um, these two objects are still these two objects, only the feet are off the ground mm -hmm. two inches. Yeah. So um, perhaps there is something for you in that when you continue on your Jedi's path and devote more time to... Mm -hmm sculpting sound, I'm sure that you your work will be informed by this duality. I have a question to Amelia, by the way. Hi, uh, big fan of your work. Uh, Hi, and thanks. I'm really interested in, in that, uh, in the mixing with the usage of harmonic series. Can you tell us more about it? Because I'm really interested in it and I would love to yeah. implement it somehow in my work. Yeah, so I mean, I just think that one of the things, and this also comes back to my strong bias towards, you know, leaning into overtones as opposed to undertones. We basically have the ability to infinitely stack things upwards and in increasingly smaller and closer distances and then have them fuse into a singular sound, which is an advantage that we can take care, take advantage of in mixing. And we don't have that same capacity subharmonically. When we start to smash things together closer as they go down, things become muddier. So there tends to be this perceptual framework, uh, the way that we can cram information into the space. And so if we think about the way a harmonic structure could influence the way that we mix you know your lo your low end needs to be completely solid like you need to have almost literally nothing except the sub the sub frequency information for whatever given harmonic structure you're trying to play with or create and then in the mid in the mid voice range we can start to see you know they start out wider and they slowly get more compact and compact and then in the upper bands you can basically get as in, an infinite amount of information that you would want to cram up there and so it mirrors the same way that we have this thing you know another thing that's important when it comes to mixing is this idea of spectral roll off so there is this acoustic phenomenon that we can observe in, in instruments, physical instruments called spectral roll off or spectral tilt. And basically, what this is, is it's the negative growth rate of harmonics. So whenever you take a harmonic series on an acoustic instrument, you always see it sloping off as it approaches the higher harmonics because of the way that energy dissipates and conserves in the system and so forth. Now, this, this process of spectral tilt is one of the, the large components that determine the way that we perceive the excitement and intensity of a timbre. And there's sort of an aesthetic beauty behind spectral tilt where when we're listening to human voices and a human voice sounds heavy and brassy or kind of agitated, that's a very flat spectral profile where the higher harmonics around 3K to 6K are more balanced against the fundamentals. So we end up with a flatter spectrum. And then when we start to slope those off and we get a lighter sound, which you might you know, think of when you're thinking of a lighter singing voice, um, that it tends to create a softer sort of pre-image. And so you can actually mix the balance of low, mid, and high frequency content in your mix to sort of imitate the spectral profile, uh, the spectral tilt profile. And so I like to make most of my mixes, unless there's a specific artistic reason to, I like to try to mix them around the like ideal aesthetic of a human voice for the spectral profile, uh, which is about negative nine to negative 12 decibels per octave fall off. So you end up with this sort of 
growth curve over time that can inform the entire like gestalt of your mix. And then another thing, if one of the things that I've been very fascinated with is taking equal temperaments or equal tunings, I don't call them temperaments, just equal tunings, and then um, make a, make songs in that or whatever. And then I'll go and I'll try to find a Neji, a near equal just intonated version of that system. And then I will inject it in the, as the pitch material. And sometimes, you know, we're talking about scent changes, depending on how far I go, of only one scent, half a scent, quarter of a scent, two cents in some cases. But the entire transparency of the thing greatly increases and lends itself to being more mixable. And so this is where, you know, I've became a strong proponent of, you know, even one cent differences or half cent differences nested over the, the span of an entire tuning make a really, really big difference because, you know, a 0.5 cent difference in the mid band is going to end up being a, a really significant difference in the upper bands. And so one of the reasons why I like just intonation, even if you can't perceivably determine, or even if you can't perceivably hear that it's pure intonation because it's so like complex or whatever, is the fact that it locks in the upper bands and you get upper band fusion, which creates and contributes to the sense of air and clarity in the mix overall. So um, there's just a lot of utility and implementation that one can get out of thinking harmonically around a mix. I hope that is helpful. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>